Hi everyone, I'm a food rheologist and I am currently on sabbatical. While I'm on sabbatical, I'm making a series of videos showing rheology in everyday life. In the last video I made, I talked about what rheology is important when you're eating foods and how you can kind of pick up rheology and relate it to texture as you are eating. And what I want to do in this video is go into a little bit more detail about how you do that with various categories of foods. And so the categories I'm talking about are solid, semi-solid, and fluid foods. So let's take a look at how we use rheology and what we measure when we want to mimic the texture and what people do when they're measuring texture when they're eating those particular foods. So let's start with fluid foods. The most important thing with fluid food is viscosity. So that's something you notice right away when you put, for example, milk in your mouth. Milk has a relatively low viscosity. If you have something with higher viscosity, it might not feel right to you. So that is really important to proper food texture. And that's one thing that we measure when we're looking at fluid foods and what is their texture supposed to be like. So we do viscosity measurements. We also look at yield stress or how much force it takes to get that fluid to flow. You're thinking about milk you want it to flow very easily you don't want it to have a high yield stress even if it's chocolate milk you want a little bit of a yield stress to keep that cocoa suspended like i talked about in a different video but you don't want it to have a really high yield stress you definitely don't want it to be spreadable for example so we also can measure the yield stress of a fluid food to kind of get an idea of what its texture is going to be like we can look at friction behaviors too and this will pick up some things that viscosity and yield stress measurements can't tell us. So friction may be able to tell us, hey, you've got some particles in this particular drink. Maybe we have a chocolate milk with some really big cocoa particles and it's giving us kind of a chalky or gritty mouthfeel. And that's not great for chocolate milk. So we can measure the friction. The friction can pick up those particles and tell us something about our food. We can also look at friction to measure or potentially measure at least astringency. So astringency is that dry puckery mouth feeling that you get when you um, have a certain type of food. So for example, cranberry juice or pomegranate juice are astringent. Um, sometimes things that are very sour are also astringent. Um, it's just that real dry feeling that you get in your mouth. And so sometimes we can pick that up as the friction increases. Not always though. Sometimes it's the case in milk. Sometimes we can measure higher friction we have more stringent milk products because yes we have some milk products that are rather stringent um, especially higher protein milks but sometimes we can't pick it up so it really kind of depends on what product we have if we want to do some friction measurements but one nice thing we can do with friction aside from astringency is tell fat content apart so if we have let's say these three different milks are three different fat contents they are likely going to have pretty different friction profiles and so we can say, okay, so this milk is our full fat milk here. It has lower friction because fat's an excellent lubricant than our skim milk over here. And then when we give it to consumers, they will usually tell us, yes, it has a different mouthfeel. So friction can help us differentiate products um, as well as viscosity and yield stress. If we look at semi-solid foods like yogurt, so these are foods you can see here. You can scoop them. They may flow a little bit under their own weight, but they're pretty thick. You can see this yogurt's making a little bit of a point here as it's sliding off the spoon. So they generally have a higher viscosity and they generally have a viscosity profile that differs when it's flowing at different shear rates or different speeds. So we can see how does that viscosity change with different rates? That might tell us something about when we put this food in our mouth, we start moving it around, how it's gonna feel. We can also measure yield stress. So we want yogurt to have a yield stress so it stays on our spoon. We don't want it to run straight off. But how much of a yield stress do we want? If it's Greek yogurt, we want a pretty high yield stress. If it's stirred yogurt like this, we want not too high of a yield stress so we can spoon it and so it has a good texture in our mouth, the texture we expect. We can also look at viscoelastic behavior. So how much viscous behavior it has, how much elastic behavior it has. Here the viscous behavior of this yogurt is letting it flow off the spoon. The elastic is allowing it to keep its shape a little bit as it does flow off. So how much of each do we have? That can be important in terms of food texture. We have too much elastic behavior, your food can be a little bit gummy. We have too much viscous behavior, it can be a little bit runny. 
And then we can also look at friction behaviors in the same way we did for uh, fluid foods and see, okay, we have any particles in here that's making our yogurt a little bit chalky or gritty. Um, that's not a great texture for yogurt, so we want to check that out and see if we can pick up something in friction that will tell us, all right, you've got some behavior in here that we weren't expecting. It might not translate to a palatable texture for a consumer. On to solid foods, like this cheese. So this cheese holds its own shape. You can see it was sliced right here. It's holding that shape very nicely. It's not going to flow under its own weight. So with solid foods, we look at viscoelastic behaviors again. So we have high elastic behavior here because it's holding its own shape. But if we have viscous behavior, that might tell us also something about the large strain compression behavior. So when you smush it between your fingers, what does it do? Does it have a sharp fracture? Does it have sort of a, a mush and not really a sharp fracture plane? Um, like Jello would, if you compress that, it breaks very nicely. But if you compress this Swiss cheese, it's more likely to just kind of mush and not really break sharply. So that can tell us something about, okay, when I bite into this, what can I expect this product to do? So that's our first three here. Viscoelastic behaviors may also be able to tell you about, okay, when I start chewing on this food, what happens? You know, does it, it take a lot of force to go through a couple of times? Is it very springy if it has a lot of elastic behavior? So Swiss cheese tends to be a little bit springier than something like an aged cheddar. It pops back into its own shape. Um, and so the viscoelastic behavior can tell you something about that. Friction behaviors is very new for solid foods. It's something that my lab is doing. It's not something that many people are looking at. But it is important if you think about, okay, somebody had to cut this cheese into this particular shape. And so that cutting as the knife through the cheese, all right, it has some friction as the cheese and the knife surface meet. And so we want a lovely smooth cut like this so we can take a very pretty picture of this cheese. But what happens if that cheese is really sticky or really crumbly? We're not gonna get a nice flat profile like this. We might get a different behavior. That's a difference in friction that translates to fracture behaviors. So if we look at friction behaviors, we can see how our solid food is going to slice or shred. So if we're putting this cheese through a processing line, let's say, we're making little slices of Swiss cheese, we want to make sure that the slices come out very uniform. You don't want to buy a package of sliced Swiss cheese and have one slice on top look good and then the next one down be all crumbled into little bits and then the one after that be twice as thick as the top two. That's not a great experience. So with solid foods, these are the kind of things we look at because with solid foods, we don't just move them around with our tongue, we actually chew them. And so we need to look at more behaviors than we do for fluid and semi-solid foods to get a better understanding of here's their rheology, here's what we think their texture might be like from the rheology. So again, just want to reiterate, texture is something that humans measure only. Uh, rheology is something we do on machines. But you can use rheology, you can use those tests to get an idea of what your fluid, solid, and semi-solid food texture is going to be like and see if you need to make any adjustments or if your food is ready to go and you can slice the Swiss cheese and have it right away on a sandwich.